can get started. Hello, everybody. Uh, thanks for joining us today in our digital neuropathology webinar series. I'm uh, Dr. Maggie Flanagan at Northwestern University, Assistant Professor of Pathology and the ADRC Northwestern Neuropath Core Leader. Today, we are going to be hearing a talk from Dr. Peter T. Nelson, Professor of Pathology and Director of Neuropathology as well as the ADRC Neuropathology Core Leader from the University of Kentucky's ADRC. He is going to be uh, presenting on quantitative digital pathology methods applied to neuropathology in order to provide us with an overview on developing and understanding questions in science that can be answered using digital neuropathology. Uh, followed by Dr. Nelson's talk, we will have the rest of the panelists join for a live question and answer session. And this includes uh, Dr. Brittany N. Duggar, Assistant Professor of Pathology and Laboratory Medicine ADRC Neuropathology Co-Core Leader at UC Davis ADRC and Co-Leader of the UC Davis School of Medicine Machine Learning Working Group, as well as Dr. Melissa E. Murray, Associate Professor of Neuroscience and ADRC Neuropathology Co-Core Leader at Mayo Clinic's ADRC, and Dr. John F. Crary, Professor of Pathology, Molecular and Cell-Based Medicine and Neuroscience, and Director of Neuropathology, Brain Bank and Research Core, as well as being the co-director of the ADRC Neuropathology Core at Mount Sinai's ADRC. So thank you all to um, the panelists today for agreeing to participate and share your wisdom and experience with our group and uh, looking forward to hearing Pete's talk. So take it away, Dr. Nelson. Thank you very kindly. Thanks to everybody for showing up. Uh, thanks to the organizers, particularly NAC, and particularly among the thank yous that goes out to Dr. Flanagan, Dr. Duggar, and Dr. Murray. Thanks you all for inviting me. So the topic of my conversation here is about digital neuropathology, trying to address scientific questions. And let me get my pointer going here. Okay. So what I'm going to be talking about, this is going to be a fairly informal talk, I'll give some examples of relevant work. Uh, describe some potential pitfalls and maybe critique some of our uh, early work in this area and uh, give a little shout out to encourage fellow neuropathologists in the field. So uh, I come from the University of Kentucky and uh, this place has been working in quantitative neuropathology metrics for many years. For decades, actually, the neurohistologist who has run this place has been Ela Patel. She's responsible for many of the great successes that we've had. And we've made a transition in the last decade or so from quantitating using manual counts to digital pathology. And uh, when I said that I was going to, to my mother that I was going to do something on digital pathology, she was wondering what that meant. She, and I'm just sort of praising, paraphrasing here, she was wondering if this was uh, a term that described the interface between pathology and proctology. But actually, no, this is actually mom using computational methods to acquire, recognize, quantify, and integrate neuropathology for research and clinical purposes. So here at the University of Kentucky for uh, over a decade, we've been uh, using this as part of our workflow. This is an area that was spearheaded uh, for us by Dr. Jana Neltner, who was a neuropath fellow, now is a neuropath faculty. She generated some algorithms to help recognize both plaques and tangles. Here's a plaque immunostain. Uh, here you can see different false colors for large, medium, and small size plaques. Uh, here's for P-tau immunohistochemistry. This is for every single case in multiple different brain areas. Uh, and what this sort of shows is that this algorithm enables, uh, due to Jana's work, us to highlight the tangles that are present in that photomicrograph and also the neuritic amyloid plaques, and then the overall tau burden in that same region. So for every single case that we do, this particular chart here is uh, sent out with the case. This is the person that organizes that, Sonia Anderson, our biobank coordinator, she's outstanding. Um, and we do this for eight different regions, uh, four limbic areas, four cortical regions, and for amyloid and various tau pathology metrics. And again, this, this is a chart that is uh, included in every single person's autopsy report that we do. So this enables us to make various different uh, observations. Uh, this is a, an example of a photomicrograph of a, a beta-stained uh, hippocampus. 
you can see the this region here is analyzed for the plaques. Um, this is a fairly um, a, a basic study just showing the difference between the plaque sizes for ApoE positive and ApoE negative. It's bigger, they're bigger for the ApoE positive ones. And you can answer all sorts of questions and address in many different ways. This is a tool that is useful for both hypothesis generation as well as hypothesis testing and for things that are sort of in between. And I thought I'd maybe provide an example of that, uh, just give an example of sort of the fun that you can have playing with your scan scope and your data. And I designed an experiment that was in silico that lasted about five or 10 minutes, and I'll give you the results of it. Basically, I arranged our cases that we had for scan scope data from youngest to oldest, and this is the age at death. And you can see that many of our cases are in the 80s. There are some that are a little bit younger, some that are, are on the old side, um, but we can arrange them from youngest to oldest in this way. And to address uh, sort of a, an interesting question, it's sort of axiomatic that when we look at people that are very old, it's very rare that you get, or it's relatively rare that you get people that have Brock stage six. And so this enables us to test that question is, uh, quantitation of the burden of tau tangles uh, does it decrease in advanced old age? And a corollary, maybe upstream question of, does the correlating A beta plaque burden change in those exact same patients? So looking at that second upstream question first, these are then those cases that we saw arranged from youngest to oldest, and the A beta plaque burden does not substantially change. It trends upward with a very low R squared. So the, the, basically the answer is there's a sustained uh, level in this sample of A beta plaque load. In the, the here we're using the parietal A beta. We can combine them and do all sorts of things. But in this case, this is what we're looking at. So then the follow-up question then is, does the cortical tau burden change or not change um, in the same group. So these are in the exact same people arranged here. And you can see there is actually a decrease in parietal tangle density in the same cases where there was not an increase or decrease in A beta uh, uh, burden in the, that cortical region. So that's a quickie five minute little study you could do. There's both hypothesis testing. It's testing the hypothesis about A beta and tau burden uh, in aging. But it's also hypothesis generation because now you have an interesting phenomenon that will enable you to generate new hypotheses about the interface between aging and neurodegenerative disease. So we've used this to address a lot of similar type of questions. Uh, for example, here, um, and the reason I'm including this is why, why I think I'm including this because uh, to illustrate something. So this is, so does APOE drive tangles in people with probable part, i.e. Uh, people that lack neuritic amyloid plaques? What you can see here is that uh, in model one, uh, where you just look at it uh, at face value, there's more tangles in the cases that are APOE positive, uh, but that did not factor in the burden of A beta plaques in the same cases. Uh, if you do that simple adjustment, and it's not that simple because it requires statistical modeling uh, by Dr. Aaron Abner, one of our statistical gurus here, uh, then that uh, difference mostly goes away. So it's important to note that it's, it's a good thing to include these data, not only as an assessment endpoint in itself, but to include as uh, covariates because it enables you to understand a little bit better what is going on. We've also used the scan scope data for a bunch of other things to correlate with other pathological phenotypes and other parameters. For example, here's a study we did uh, looking at the density of uh, neocortical tau tangles uh, uh, correlated to a genotype. And there's many other things that you can do in which we have done. Uh, but I'm not gonna spend most of this time talking about plaques and tangles. The main thing you talk to about that is to describe some of the pitfalls that we've sort of encountered. And I just sort of wanted to enumerate some of them. We sort of think of the um, pathological phenomenon we see as lesion counts, uh, as though it's a number, but it's actually a density. Uh, the density reflects the fact that it's the number divided by the surface area of the area that we have evaluated. And that denominator uh, changes quite a bit for example, with brain atrophy, uh, which can be extreme in cases such as 
uh, hippocampal sclerosis. Uh, there's also a uh, denominator change in terms of the surface area when we do formal and fixed paraffin embedding and other processing changes. There's post-death morphology changes, which is probably more related to ultrastructural changes in light microscope level, but it is still can be important. And it's also uh, important to note that this is cross-sectional data. These lesions are probably not static and then unchanging. They come and go, particularly the amyloid plaques probably come and go, come and go. So it's important to keep that in mind that the, the overall structure of what we're looking at is, is cross-sectional. Also important to note that IHC is still IHC. We, when we look at something like tau tangles or A beta, you're talking about an extremely robust antigen and a very high signal to noise. Most epitopes are not of that characteristics and uh, they can be far more problematic. There is the garbage in, garbage out problem. And I'm gonna talk a little bit more about that in a few slides. Another point that I wanted to make, and this is something that I have probably made a mistake on a number of times, is that in order to succeed in this field, you need to rely on younger, smarter people. So there have been a lot of younger, smarter people that have helped with our work. Um, they're totally necessary. It needs a skill set. It's very much team science, but it's important to keep in mind that these inexperienced people need training and supervision and that they may not, although they may be smarter than you, they they uh, have some areas where you may uh, still be responsible for teaching them and helping them. So moving on from Alzheimer's stuff, this is a paper that we published a couple of years ago. Uh, this is about TDP proteinopathy in aging. A lot of this work was done by Jean Borgal, who has since moved on to Princeton, uh, and is looking at TDP proteinopathy in the hippocampus. And so this is a H&E stained hippocampus uh, this is the serial section that has been immunolabeled for phosphorylated TDP43. You can see that it's been uh, uh, evaluated in such a way to look differently um, at the subiculum, CA1, dentate granule cells. Uh, and it not only was evaluated for the different anatomical regions, but the subsets of the subtypes of, of the TDP proteinopathy for example, the burgundy color here stains uh, mostly cytoplasmic inclusions, whereas the phosphorylated TDP43 neurites are highlighted uh, with this yellow marker. And so all that is highlighted can be quantitated and returned and evaluated. So we did this uh, study looking at the correlations between genotypes and other biochemical features. Um, one of the things we found is that indeed brains that have uh, inclusions tend to have more inclusions, tend, ones that had those small neurites tend to have, have small neurites in other regions. Um, this is sort of an interesting finding, but it is not very surprising to those of us that have looked at a few uh, brain sections. I think that one thing that I would say is a take home from this study is that the interesting results, I, I, I don't I have any uh, regret about it. And, but I would say that if you're looking at this many parameters and doing this many correlations in retrospect, I would say that it's probably better to use a larger sample size uh, to improve your uh, statistical power. But this um, results that we got from this study did contribute to what has become an emerging uh, pathogenetic hypothesis about how some of the genetics and the endophenotypes of the pathology uh, correlate. And we hypothesize that some of the genetic findings we've have uh, correlates with brain thyroid hormone re regulation, which contributes to small vessel disease, particularly arteriosclerosis, and that contributes to the HS pathological phenotype. And I'm going to give some examples of components of this uh, hypothetical pathogenic cascade that we have come about uh, studying with digital neuropathology, starting with this one, which was the first of those things that we found. So we found that if you looked at various different large autopsy series, that there was a correlation between brain arteriolosclerosis pathology as operationalized using the semi-quantitative zero to three conventional scale with hippocampal sclerosis, which we now know is a subset of late. Uh, so we wanted to look at that in a more quantitative way. And so we used uh, metrics that came from immunohistochemical staining of the brain with various different markers that stain small blood vessels. And then we came to 
focus down on SMA, which stains arterioles, and CD34, which recognizes uh, the internal lining of all blood vessels, but particularly uh, dense for uh, capillaries. And what we found, which was interesting, and it correlated with the findings that we had made um, using the semi-quantitative data, was that for HS, the people with pathology had larger blood vessel perimeters compatible with a quantitative operationalization of brain arteriolosclerosis. This was not seen in uh, capillaries. Uh, this difference was also not seen for Alzheimer's disease pathology. It was specific for the HS, and this was in a region uh, where it's not affecting the hippocampus. This was in frontal cortex that these changes were uh, observed. So these help solidify our primary uh, observation, which is that the normal arterioles in the cases with what we now know is late with uh, hippocampal sclerosis uh, have um, uh, arteriolosclerosis type geometric changes. Now, the way that we came up with this uh, um, uh, decision for how we operationalize capillaries in arterioles with CD34 and SMA respectively was because CD31, collagen 4, and factor 8, which also mark uh, uh, small blood vessels, had poorer um, technical parameters. They were less robust for uh, um, in the face of fixation. We did an experiment where we took the same tissue and we fixed it for different periods of time. And these markers were much more labile for different times of fixation than SMA and CD34. And so this is why we came to these. But And it worked really well for this study. But Later, when we tried to gather tissue from a bunch of different other places to do a similar study of small blood vessels, it's been more problematic and it's been more difficult. And so we're sort of reaching the phase of not knowing whether we're, we should really uh, deal with this in, with multi-sample uh, cohort analysis of small blood vessels. And it gets to the point of garbage in correlating to garbage out. And I wanna talk about that a little bit more because the quality of the data that you have at the end of the day relates to the characteristics of the upstream histopathological preparations. And one of the reasons I say that is, is that part of our um, uh, work that we did on this was to use data that came from two different sources. One was from the University of Kentucky Alzheimer's Disease Research Center, um, where it's been run by that Ela Patel person, the outstanding neurohistologist, and others from the UK pathology department, which has different characteristics different burdens, much, much more higher workflow, most of which is not brain stuff. And we noticed that there was different uh, outcomes when we looked in the from the different sources. And so we did a very simple experiment. And we took several veins, chopped them up, and took half of those same brains and, and gave them to UK ADRC and half of them to the pathology department for processing and embedding. And we did indeed find different differences um, between them. So for the UK DRC, it was more smooth uh, and the embedding uh, was uh, not cracked. And there were some artifacts in the pathology department samples. Uh, these changes were reflected also in the histopathology itself, which were a little bit more moth eaten in the samples that came from the pathology department. So we decided that it may be useful to the broader field and we described to the field how our ADRC is processing them because we think that this step is worthy of consideration in the digital pathology era where you want to have good stuff upstream so that you can have endpoints that are, are uh, better studyable with good technical properties. So in conclusion, in addition to the actual cool actual data that we found that I think is robust, uh, we did learn in retrospect that what works in one sample uh, may not work in others, and you got to be careful about the garbage in, garbage out problem. So what about some unpublished data? So getting back to this uh, hypothetical uh, pathway or cascade, uh, we say genetics is leading to thyroid hormone dysregulation, leading to small vessel disease, and uh, leading to HS. Uh, I wanted to give some data related to this connection here. And in order to do that, we looked at a uh, a uh, experimental context that we can uh, control fairly well, which is little mousies, little mousy brains. And this work was done by Dr. Dana Niedowitz, an excellent scientist in the lab. 
and she stained uh, the brains of a bunch of mice uh, with CD34 and SMA. I'm just going to present the CD34 data right now. Uh, this is uh, uh, CD34 immunoreactive small blood vessels that have been recognized by the uh, image scope and Genie software. So what this enables you to do is assess very carefully things you would not be able to appreciate with your naked eye. So this is a profile of a blood vessel. This is a blood vessel wall, this is the lumen, and you can look at the various geometric characteristics of the blood vessel. This is the how uh, the uh, sort of the perimeter of the blood vessel. This is the lumen area. This is the wall thickness of the stain that you are measuring. In our case here, we're talking about CD34. And you can do that in three groups is what uh, Dana did. She looked at controls and these were all aged mice. She gave some thyroxine enough to give them high thyroid hormone in their blood, which is a uh, model for hyperthyroidism that affects about 5% of older people. And she also gave propothiouracil with uh, methoxamine, methimazole, I mean, so propothiouracil with methimazole, which basically are toxins that adversely affect the thyroid gland so that you have hypothyroidism. And that's a model for the 20% of elder people who have hypothyroidism. So we didn't know what to predict, but this is what came out of her analyses just for the CD34. Was it the vessel perimeter, which you see here, was increased in the hypothyroid model? Also, the lumen area was also increased in the hypothyroid model. But surprisingly to us, the wall thickness uh, was increased in the hyperthyroid model. So these are things we're following up on, and I think is a very interesting vein of research that Dr. Dana Niedowitz is doing. Okay, so now to plagiarize from Monty Python, we're doing something completely different and giving another example of unpublished data that's hot off the presses using a different technique. So this is a, 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 an afternoon I spent with a machine that is presumptuously called the TMA Grand Master. This is a machine that you put a bunch of formal and fixed paraffin embedded uh, cassettes into and it creates a tissue microarray. How does it do that? Well, it enables you to look at each one of the tissue pieces and generate cores that it puts onto a microarray. So this is a, um, a, you can see that this is neocortical region. This is the gray matter. This is the white matter. <clears throat> All these tissue samples are, uh, most of them that are not controls <clears throat> are in fact uh, frontal, middle frontal gyrus, Rodman area nine. And so it enables you to punch out cores and put them into the uh, tissue microarray and assign them different spots on there. These are the two gray matter ones. This is a separate array that we did for white matter. And at the end of the day, you, are, um, you have a tissue microarray that looks something like this. This is a uh, paraffin embedded. All these spots here are actually cores from the frontal cortex, most of them, uh, and or our controls. And then you can section it and stain it in various different ways for various different things. So for example, uh, one of the uh, sections we stained for a beta. So this is a beta. So you can see that some of the cores fall out or they act a little sketchy, but for the most part, you can recognize that some of these are a beta immunoreactive, a lot of plaques here. And then this, this one is a control. Uh, and so there are different things you can uh, then correlate with these findings. So these are 90 odd different brains with 90 odd different histories and genetics and pathologies. And you can correlate it with different things given just one section. So what is the next step? How do you make that interesting? Well, one of the way you make that interesting is to have great colleagues and which we have in spades here in the University of Kentucky. This is an outstanding upcoming meteorically rising uh, faculty member, Dr. Ramon Sun, and a grad student that's working in his lab, Tara Hawkinson. These are very, very smart people that are doing really neat things and that are working together with us on the tissue microarray project. So they do on-slide mass spectrometry for high-resolution metabolomics imaging using a bunch of machines that I probably can't even pronounce right. But they it enables them to work up uh, in a point-by-point, high-resolution way 
uh, where particular biochemical phenomena are that are measurable on the slides. And it produces a lot of interesting data and some beautiful images, such as this dragon-like looking uh, uh, rendered hippocampus. They can, on the slide, with very small granular resolution, analyze metabolites using a technique called MALDI, which I had to look up because it stands for Matrix Assisted Laser Desorption and Ionization, that enables them to study things such as glycogen on the slide, lipid metabolism on the slide, and the presence and quantitative characteristics of complex carbohydrates right there on the slide. And again, this is all a wonderful slides that were prepared by Dr. Ramon's son. He's just letting us borrow it. And I wanted to show you some very, very hot off the presses data the, to underscore. And just to jump in, Pete, you're at about uh, 25 minutes. So. Okay, yeah. so almost done, almost done. Thank you though, thanks for reminder. So uh, this enables you to look at low throughput regional spatial analysis as shown here and also high throughput meta level analyses that can be correlated with the findings on a tissue microarray. So uh, you can look at single cell resolution either way. And so cutting to the quick, and uh, this is very, very hot off the presses, just sent to us by Dr. Sun, showing that there are unique glycan uh, tra track features that go along with the Alzheimer's disease related pathologies. Here is a heat map. Here's what the actual primary data look like. And here's what some of the uh, digested data look like. So I think that that's really exciting and it underscores that team science can be good. But I'm just gonna segue to the last two minute point that I wanna make, which is that team science can also be a little bit dreary sometimes. Here in this cartoon, you see this person living the high life and this person uh, grumbling that he hates the team science approach. I think we can all at some various times be contributors, be helpers, uh, be uh, this person on the totem pole, but I would say that it's important to note that, that this should not always be the neuropathologist. Why? Neuropathologists, we have special things. So this is just my sister and brethren in the neuropathology field, just as a little pump me up. We are people that have access to the ultimate animal model. We understand the diseases, that have access to an understanding of the tissues and the anatomy, the cells we can look at and understand better than anybody else and the lesions we have better comprehension of than everybody else. And also the molecules that drive these pathologies, we have a special knowledge of it. What really this boils down to is the complexity. Everybody outside of our field wants biochemistry to be complicated, uh, genetics to be complicated, imaging to be complicated, but they want pathology to be simple, but that is not good. It's not simple, it's complex. And we are the people that are aware of that complexity and we can help the team with that. So I would just follow that up by saying, neuropathology is a key ingredient. And just to underscore that, I know it's axiomatic that too many cooks spoil the broth, but we're an important cook for the broth. And it's not just for our field, but for the betterment of the field itself, that I think that neuropathologist has to keep their point, step up and be a big part of that team. So I want to thank uh, the team here at University of Kentucky, folks like Dr. Neltner, Dr. Wilcock, uh, Ela Patel, Sonia Anderson, Doug Price that are integral to the neuropathology core and the ADRC in general. I believe in choosing your boss wisely. Dr. Linda Van Eldick is a great boss. And with that, I will say thank you and open it up for the broader discussion. Thanks so much. That was great. Um, really liked the pumping up neuropath at the end too. That was awesome. <laughs> uh, so we have quite a few questions coming in. Uh, so why don't we start with a question from Dr. John Trojanowski. How do your clinical colleagues understand the quantitative data? Anybody wants to take that to comment on? I would say that when put into the context of the patient space, or something that the clinician actively engages in, whether that's neuroimaging or other aspects, then it really digests well. I think as neuropathologists and translational neuropathologists, we really want to try to bring neuropathology to other fields and, and translate it into that context. I think when we stay in our 
myopic world, then in a way we build a barrier that doesn't need to be there because we really want to help inform the beginning, which is the patient space. Yeah. Um, Dr. Nelson, are you scanning all of your neurodegenerative autopsy slides? Yes. Okay. That's an easy one. Uh, then I have another question. What resources and personnel do you have to accomplish your digital neuropathology, including scanning, managing files, analysis, et cetera? Uh, if you could provide exact numbers of uh, the staff and their levels. So for example, how many undergrads versus full-time staff, et cetera, that would be appreciated. We have an undergrad scanner. We have a biobank coordinator, and then we have a whole team of informatics folks. So the, it does require a lot of work. We work together with our uh, cancer center. We have uh, forged a, um, a workaround where they pay for our, our warranty. And in return, they get three days a week scanning. And so they give us a bung load of work. And so the, that's the undergrad, Mr. Panhebluth Fay, who's great, uh, very careful. Um, and uh, I think that's an integral person. The it, um, people that have worked with scan scoping uh, machines, not just necessarily the Imperial one, the Leica one, uh, know that it also requires a lot of support from your IT folks. And so they've been very integral to the whole operation as well. Thanks. Does anybody else want to comment on? I'd be I very curious. Follow-up question, uh, Dr. Nelson. How much data, so if you're scanning all your slides, how big is that data? Those it's data? Huge. It's, it's hundreds of, it's, many dozens of terabytes, we're well over a hundred terabytes at this point. And then how many cases? So cases, terabytes that you that? I'm sorry? Uh, cases, number of cases. That um, that hundreds, I mean, hundreds of cases. You saw the, the analysis that I did in five minutes, that was I think 280 or something like that. Mm -hmm. um, so we're just going, trying to go further and further back in time with the analyses. I love it. I have a IHC team is what I call it, and it's a mix of postbacs, program coordinators, actually a, a woman with business background, which was very helpful. Um, and so those are the individuals that scan, trace. We have a phenomenal IT uh, person that supports research in general, and it, I don't think we can underscore enough how important that interaction with IT is. And that's after the fact of all the staining, I think we have to keep in mind what the histology cores really allow us to do, and especially operating more of a digital um, or uh, operative process that allows for your stains to be somewhat uniform. That garbage in, garbage out was an excellent point, Pete. Yeah, and for us, we're a little bit different here at UC Davis. We have similar structures, right? Just we can't emphasize enough that you do need dedicated staff for a lot of these things, um, especially with scanning, um, management, working with IT, um, and then even talking about storage. Do you want rapid storage? Do you want to put stuff away? We call it glacial storage to have it more back there. Um, but I do a lot of machine learning, and the biggest thing that's awesome, I say I do it. I really don't. I work with, uh, I'm at a great institution that has a huge depth and breadth of disciplines. And one of that is engineering departments. And so I get a lot of wonderful students, some of which are on the line right now. So I have uh, Lucos probably on the line and Jeff and even across the country. It, it's just great to work with a lot of these students. And, and Pete or Dr. Nelson, you highlighted it quite well. Is It's really a team, a multidisciplinary team to get this stuff off the ground. I can't emphasize that enough. Hopefully that helps with people. Uh, you could feel free to follow up with us after uh, for details because obviously it's just a short session, but yeah. Dr. Perry, Dr. Flanagan. Um, Tell you a little bit about, sorry. Yes, like, I'm, I'm sorry. <laughs> Quite amazing with um, with COVID. We on the clinical side, we transitioned 100% to digital pathology. So all of the clinical cases are coming out. So not all of our autopsy cases uh, that are getting banked are going through the clinical side. So um, Dr. Harutunian, who's on the call here, has a dedicated team, um, and they're scanning. And we're going to make all of these cases available through an Amazon 
web services account, and that's going to come soon through the NeuroBioBank. And I think that's one of the most exciting things about these digital images is that we can share them. And we're going to start to be able to do really large collaborative projects together using these digital images. Um, but one of the problems, and I love that Pete highlighted this, is the pre-analytical variables, right? How are we preparing these tissues if we're using different antibodies, if we're using different th section thicknesses. Um, in, the, in the old days when we were doing categorical variables or ordinal variables, um, it wasn't as much of a problem. AD, yes, no, mild, moderate, severe for plaques. But I think this next generation of studies that we see the potential to do, these quantitative studies, we're going to have to go back and think about whether or not we need to start um, harmonizing our methods. And so I, I, I love that paper, Pete, that you put out about just embedding, tissue embedding. You know, that is the, that, that's the key, right? That all these little pieces. And so maybe we need to be thinking more about how we can collaborate around tissue pr preparation. Yeah, I agree. And uh, there's a question kind of that goes along with <laughs> your comment is, uh, perhaps you're going to talk about it, but is there an attempt to execute a common digital pathology protocol across ADRCs? Um, we are working on it. Um, actually, a lot of people on this call, Dr. Murray, Dr. Flanagan, uh, Dr. Carey, I believe, um, we're all trying to work on a pilot study right now. But we have a lot of hurdles involved with that. So unlike radiology, where you have a lot of standardization of just file types, here we don't. Each scanner will have its own proprietary file type. And even within that, you'll have what's all these other metadata um, and aspects to it, like compression rate and that. So we have a lot of other hurdles to overcome with that. But that standpoint of could we just get it into um, a system for people to look at? Yes, that's probably feasible. But as even Dr. Nelson pointed out to echo, is even our processing can be different, right? And that's what's great about our neuropath cores is we are different and we do have different methodologies. That sometimes isn't a bad thing, um, but how do you standardize something that is, and what matters, right? I think those are the other questions too. We're, we're doing um, some preliminary work right now with our machine learning. Do, do compression rates matter? Um, when you're scanning in slides, a 40% versus 75% compression rate, does that matter with your counting um, and, all that kind of stuff. I don't know, uh, Dr. Murray, do you have anything to add? Because uh, you're helping uh, big with the, the pilot study here. Yeah, so one of, on our off months, so right now we're all interacting with you guys and I love it. Um, Dr. Flanagan, you've done an amazing job with this webinar series. We meet as a team to really think about those questions. <clears throat> we haven't gotten to the stains portion yet, but now it's the time, how are we able to share slides? And that gets us to the point of really thinking about what we need to do towards standardization. And fortunately, NAC's been really supportive. So trying to mirror off a lot of what we would initially do. So we hope to have more updates on that. And then <clears throat> the Chan Zuckerberg Initiative has a big push right now for modernizing neuropathology. And so the hope will be that this could maybe also be a nice way to hopefully dovetail with the NIH to, to address this problem because we're all looking at some of the same things, but different stains may have different aspects of biology that then may inform your opinion about the case. And so it's a fantastic question and we're, we're making strides, but <laughs> time will talk. One of the things that we did and um, many, I think all of the speakers on this call were involved with was the part uh, working group collaboration. And maybe I should, just tell everybody a little bit about that and what the experience was, because I think it's gonna be very relevant. So when we, um, we defined that um, category, um, it became very clear that it's probably a, a quantitative variable. It's an age-related temporal lobe tangle burden measure. And that the BRAC staging that we're using, it works, but maybe it wasn't good enough. And we wanted to start getting better clinical pathological correlations. We were also interested in discovering genes. And we felt that the best way to do this would be to get a lot of cases of people without any amyloid plaques and then measure the tau burden. And we got over a thousand hippocampi from across the country. All of the sections were sent to the uh, University of Texas Southwestern and, and Dr. Chuck White is on the call. And he stained all of those sections, all the same thickness with Luxol fast blue counter stain H&E, 
I did an ATA stain. And so now we have this digital data set of all of the sections being treated exactly the same way uh, in terms of the staining. Of course, the pre-staining stuff, you know, varied from center to center. Um, but just the first papers are just coming out. We have papers in review now with the first genes that we've been able to discover. But I can tell you that when we used the BRAC stage that was provided by the center, all of the associations were kind of weak. Um, but when we moved to the next step, which was positive pixel counts, um, then we started to see something. And we had much, much stronger correlations with cognitive impairment. And we're starting to see some really interesting genetics there. So I have to say that we're going to save a lot of money and we're going to be able to squeeze a lot more uh, significant results when we quantify. I'd like, I, I loved Pete's point about his APOE study quantifying plaques. You know, if you, once you start to quantify, you know, you're, you start to see different P values. So uh, that, that was, I think that's probably the summary of the part working group that it can be done. We can stain lots of sections all in the same way. And we're going to start to see some really interesting stuff. I guess the future on top of that is um, the next generation quants, right? So it's probably worth mentioning um, Tomlinson, the, uh, father of neuropathology, if we're in a quantitative neuropathology session, I guess the word digital is added, but he was the first one to start to quantify plaques and tangles. And um, we've known that it's really important, but then something happened in 1961, the American Stereology Society was founded. And then through the 1980s and the 1990s, there were a lot of pioneers applying stereology to neuropathology, but I think it kind of paralyzed the field. Stereology is amazing, but it's hard and time consuming. And it's not easy to apply these, uh, Peter's gonna comment, but it's not easy to apply stereology to neuropath situations. You can use the principles, but um, it's not perfect. But there's been more and more, I think, with, with these slides, digital whole slide images becoming available, people are using other approaches to quantify. I think Pete might say something about, I'm going to try to guess, counting tangles, counting cells is hard. But a lot of the stuff we're doing with positive pixels is that they're burden measurements. So there's other types of richness in those slides that we're going to be able to pull out. And I think that's the big potential right now. Um, Brittany's using AI, we are too, other people are. So that's going to be really important. Did you want to add anything to that, Dr. Nelson? Or oh, not really. I basically agree. I agree with what John said. Okay, cool. Uh, so the next question is, are you analyzing the entire tissue sample or just representative parts? What software do you use? And how do you address the bias of choosing the ROIs? Is that for me? Whoever, yeah, anybody who wants to jump in. Yeah. I could jump in just a little bit because I think that's key. I think that's crucial. That's the core. So Dr. Kuranai Tanji, who was my mentor at Columbia University, used to tell me that there are three things that are important when it comes to a neuropathological diagnosis. And it's the same as New York City real estate, location, location, location. The neuroanatomy defines the diseases, right? We have these plaque and tangle burdens and cell loss, but we really need to do that better. And so segmenting these sections is, I think, one of the biggest challenges that we're going to have. I was going to ask Pete when he showed his, his, um, his course in his uh, tissue microarray, you got gray matter and you got white matter on there. Um, we're, we're getting, I guess it's relatively easy to do gray matter versus white matter, but when we start to get to more complex parts of the brain, the brain stem, the um, different cortical regions, um, you know, what, what Brodmann region are you in? You think you have Brodmann area 9, um, but maybe you accidentally got BA10. So we, we, need to, we need to think about segmenting better. Well, to address that real quick, just problem area nine, as everybody knows, is not exactly the most specific thing in the world, and it's a, sort of an approximation. Uh, if you look at different Brobman maps, the but in terms of res responding to the specific question, we do dissect out those particular areas um, 
preferentially uh, with every case, we get a frontal, a parietal, an occipital, and a temporal, and we have specific areas that we look in for specific landmarks. Um, and so that I agree that that the section is very important and that that reporting is only as as accurate as the dissection itself was that went into it. Um, the um, it's it's not easy because some things like the amygdala is very different in one case to another. <laughs> and so um, how you do that is going to be a little bit uh, challenging for some cases. But I was just going to say for tracing purposes, <clears throat> if it's a neuroimaging based study, my team will trace the entirety of the cortex pertaining to whatever is of interest. If it's superior temporal, they'll trace the whole uh, gray matter cortices. If it's a clinical path study that doesn't involve more of a, a systems approach, tracing the straight of the gyrus, I've found is the most representative. You have to be careful if you go to the depth of the sulcus or the rise of the gyrus because there can be alterations based on the surface area. So we've found really pretty good reproducibility with the straight. And then if it's internal structures, like you just brought up the amygdala, we'll trace the whole amygdala, but we, we use very defined neuroanatomic boundaries that we'll use depending on the structure of interest. So just set a standard or look to see if others have set a standard and just be consistent. Because if you have subtleties along, at least they're the same across all of your individuals, especially within with your controls. And to follow up on that, just this is maybe a little bit more anecdotal. So with those tracings, right? So we're in brain banks and brain banks has been in existence for 20, 30 years. So you might have had different people sample over time. It happens. And so we're working on a lot of segmentation models. So what Dr. Murray said, this tedious thing of tracing, we're just trying to do that quicker with machine learning processes. So we started to do this. And as an output variable, you would expect cortex to be smaller in Alzheimer's disease, right? It's neurodegeneration. When we got our results back, and this is one of those kind of like duh moments, we were finding that the Alzheimer's was pretty much the same as the normals, but maybe a little bit bigger. And we're like, this doesn't make sense. This doesn't make sense. And we started looking at the slides. Think about when we sample as neuropathologists, we put things in a cassette that's about this big. When you have shrinkage of cortex, you could have more in that cassette. So you have more of the Alzheimer's because of the shrinkage to fit in there as opposed to a normal. And so if you're doing just a per area, just to be aware of this, if you're doing just a per area, you might be oversampling with the Alzheimer's disease. So again, I know it's a little bit anecdotal, but things to be aware of when you're trying to do some of this stuff because you're like, wait, so we, we added like tangential measurements and everything to kind of account for this. But I think um, Dr. Kukul put in here about the statistical analysis. So we talked about the computer engineers as well as the IT people. It's really important to involve statisticians from the beginning as well, because you're combining things from multiple centers. You can have center bias and to make sure you have that sort of dialogue with multiple aspects. I, I hope that helps because that was something that we learned right away. We're like, wait a second, this, these data don't make sense. And yeah, there you go, because you're fitting more because there's a generation is a cassette. And if I can, that's a good point, Dr. Duggar. One other point I just sort of make from sharing my screen real quick is that, so in our original 2012 paper, sort of related to some of the stuff that Dr. Murray was talking about and some of the questions that were asked here is sort of the workflow, but also we, we do it by boxes, not by highlighting the whole region. And we found that if you just sort of randomly put the boxes, how many it takes to make it so that you reach sort of an asymptote of the amount that you're gonna end up with. And so it came up with a number of five. This basically, if you put five, it gets you to that point. So we have at least five for every one of our uh, regions of interest, but that's sort of a, just a stochastic number that we came at that seems to be where it sort of uh, it levels out at, um, but um, I, it may be different for different folks the way they do it. I wanna to respond to something that Dr. Murray said before about being consistent. Um, so we've been, so we've been talking about segmenting the amygdala and how to draw it, how to draw around it and sampling around it. Um, we've been trying to segment the hippocampus and you know, it's a lot harder than you think. We know that there's a corneal monus, CA1, 2, 3, and 4, but where CA1 ends and CA2 starts and CA3 starts, it's anybody's game. And when we went to the neuroanatomy literature, um, they had equally 
they, they said it's equal, you know, a problem equally for them. We were looking at H and E stain sections. So it would be really nice if we had validated protocols for segmenting these really important regions. So we went to the literature and looked to see if there was a segmentation protocol, because we all are going to need to segment our hippocampi and amygdala and all these other regions, and we didn't see it. And I have my experimental neuropathology fellow uh, listening in, Dr. Esma Karlovich, and she presented, I'm going to give her a shout out, she presented her segmentation protocol for the hippocampus on H&E sections um, at the AANP this year. So this is Although it's not, we're not talking about quantification, but we're talking about where are you doing the quantification. I think this is going to be really helpful, and it's going to be an important um, contribution so that we can at least talk about the same things. Um, and she validated this protocol across a whole bunch of different modalities, different section thicknesses, different um, immunohistochemical stains that bring out and highlight the different regions. So um, stuff like that I think is going to be helpful. That'd be cool. And um, one thing is the imaging, the neuroimaging community has worked really hard on this because they're trying to do the subsectors. So it'll be interesting and you may have already kind of compared and they do have, there's a hippocampal, they're doing a harmonization effort. So it'd be nice to see how well that translates since you have the much more ultra microscopic level than they have access to. Cause they even contacted DeVernoy who wrote like the, I like the older version, but like, I don't know this. I mean, I know when you start to get into the subsectors, it gets a bit ridiculous, but yeah, that'll be great, John. It would be more. really interesting to see how they're, if they could segment and then you can co-register with the human, with the, uh, with our slides. Yeah. yeah. Agreed. Well, even Dr. Murray, this reminds us of our past. Remember we would sit with hours in Dr. Jack's lab of what instrument they used to trace the hippocampus? Was it a pen tool? What type of mouse did they use? If we wanted to get down to the nitty gritty, that's what they were, do you remember those days? Or yeah, that? that's in fact, so I, uh, we studied under Cliff Jack and that is, uh, ironically, the imaging, how strict we were with that is what really influenced the digital pathology side. Like I even still use the rise because there are some obscure aspects and that's, one of the reasons we'll use very specific neuroanatomic, so we like to use the dentate fascia and we'll go halfway through for looking at the CA1 to subiculum and it seems so particular, but it does help. And I imagine for you where you experienced 20 plus different centers contributing to your cohort. Unfortunately, we have the lateral geniculate, but. <laughs> yeah. And not everybody samples the hippocampus in the same way my mentors taught me that you should always include that lateral geniculate in your section and that you should include the entire um, lateral ventricle in that section and the collateral sulcus and parahippocampal. Yeah, and that way you get a little bit of basal ganglia in there. Yep. But a lot of people, they just grab the hippocampus proper and just pop it in. And that was a surprise to me. It's nice because you can fit two in one cassette, but you don't really know exactly where you are. I just wanted to comment and say that I really appreciate that the standardization and work that your group's doing for guidance because yeah it's just been really challenging to come into this and yeah encounter all of these uh variations between samples and um I think yeah this is all really exciting that we're all going to be more on the same page yeah, so public service, not put, for those that are publishing papers using human tissue, just don't say brain. If you can, just give a little bit more of a description of what you used. <laughs> or frontal cortex, the other one is, frontal, we use frontal cortex. You're like, where? Just, just a little bit more would be great. <laughs> I have a specific question here for Dr. Nelson. What are the red circles drawn around the sample circles on the arrays from Grandmaster? The red circles. I don't know, let me see what you're talking about here. I'm not sure what the red circles are. So I don't know. Maybe on your TMAs where it highlighted was that because I know there's TMA applications. Is it is red drawing? Is she said. Uh, the the red circle. I think the one there was one red circle that was just indicating where that particular core is going on the TMA uh, Grandmaster. That's where that red circle, it's just, it's just showing as you populate your TMA, it just fills it in one by one. And the one that you're actually is actively being stuck into, that's the red circle. 
I'm looking at it now. Uh, so I guess what I can do is I can, I think you're talking about this. Uh, and this is, so this core went to this spot on the tissue microarray. I think that's what you're asking. And you guys were talking about segmenting the, uh, the hippocampus. He was saying they were irregular drawings. If that helps. Regular drawings. No, Actually, regular. Me, just real quick. Adam Boxstatter did some work using the aperioscope, doing looking at different types of microglia, and he was specifically looking at different parts of the, the hippocampus to try to segment that along the lines of what John was talking about. And he found some differences based upon the uh, of the different subtypes of microglia. Um, and, and these were the different types, the ramified, hypertrophic, dystrophic, rod-shaped, and amoeboid. Uh, some of them were augmented in the HS late cases. And interestingly, this rod-shaped phenotype seemed to be more um, enhanced in the, in the cases that were DLB and the various different regions of the hippocampus. And we had no idea what the hell that means. That's just phenomenology at this point. But it's sort of an example of something where uh, you can do an experiment and it, it's hypothesis generating that there's some subtype of microglia that seems to be relatively um, enriched in a particular subtype of, of, uh, of pathology. But anyway, you triggered me by talking about uh, segmenting the hippocampus. No, that was so great. I, I don't know the answer to the red, the red. I'm not exactly sure what that means. Sure, either. Yeah, this is great. Thank you all. Um, there's another maybe last question we can try to address, which is what database are you using to manage and store all of the data being generated by digital pathology? Um, this goes into our data management core where they have a SQL back, back end, massive, fancy uh, database. Uh, and then they give me digested version that's Excel that enables me with my puny little brain to figure out how to do analyses on. So um, the data are in a fancy database, SQL based, that is very um, also tied in with all the other ADRC data. Uh, and then um, it gets digested down for uh, simple analyses uh, in various ways, but including into Excel files. Can I uh, say something related to that? Because I think this is also going to be really important moving forward. Um, right now, now our, our data structure that we're using for the NAC is very limited. It's very specific uh, measures that we've all agreed are important. But now we're leveraging digital pathology and quantifying all kinds of stuff. And we're gonna to wanna to share these measures across centers. And so I think digital pathology is gonna really push us to rethink the way that we structure neuropath data. Right now, we just have a few features, plaque burden, tangle burden, but there's so many different features related to white matter and vascular and all, you know, microglia. And, and it's going to be so easy for us to quantify this stuff, especially with the AIs that we're working on with Brittany and others. So we have been pulling, you know, tons of features out and how are we going to share this? So I think we should think about that, um, how we're going to share all of these features. I think the question might have also been related to kind of a separate thought is how do you save all these digital image files. If that was the question, look at histomics. Uh, that um, platform has been really free and good. But you can also use a Burio um, to share. That's great. I think we're right at the hour. So thank you all so much for your participation today, Dr. Nelson. That was an amazing talk. And Actors Murray, Duggar, and Crary for all of your insight and advice. And I just wanted to wrap up by announcing the next session. Uh, it will be a Perio software overview and applications uh, presented by Dr. Melissa Murray, and it will be on October 11th, uh, 11 a.m. Eastern. So hope to see everybody there, and thanks for everybody for participating today as well. Mm -hmm. uh, see you next time. <laughs> Good job, Pete. Thanks, y'all. Thank you very much.